Let me just throw something out here before we get started. If you wanted to be the worst possible sinner that you could be, what would you do? Not something that, that your pastor is going to often ask you, but if you wanted to sin the worst, in the worst possible ways, how, what, would you, what would you do? Uh, where, what, what would you, how would you formulate your life if you wanted to go down in history as the worst possible sinner ever? Manasseh. And this is where, this is where our reading picks up. 2 Kings 21, starting at verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, or the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations when the Lord, whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal, and made an Asherah, as Ahab king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his son as an offering, and used fortune-telling and omens, and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of Asherah that he had made, he set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers, if only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations that had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. And the Lord said by his servants the prophets, Because Manasseh king of Judah has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did who were before him, and has made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done what is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made Judah to sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did, and the sin that he committed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Manasseh slept with his fathers and was buried in the garden of his house, in the garden of Uzzah, and Amon his son reigned in his place. So, going through the ancestors of Christ... Of all of Christ's ancestors, Manasseh might be the most wicked, the one who is the most vile of sinners, of all of these people that are in the line of Christ. Two times in our passage here, the word despicable was used in verses 2 and 11. Maybe you noticed that. It's also the same uh, word that is sometimes translated as an abomination. It's only used, this word is only used four times in the whole book of 2 Kings, and two of those times are just for Manasseh right here. He plunges into unprecedented idolatry. 
idolatry that nobody has ever seen before here in these nations. So in verse 3, it talks about the high places, how he rebuilt them. He reversed his father's religious reforms. So his father was Hezekiah, and one of the things that he did was he removed the high places. Now, high places were places of worship outside Jerusalem. And the reason why he removed them is because when you made sacrifices, there needed to be priests there, and they needed to follow a certain procedure. But when people would sacrifice at the high places, they would kind of sacrifice them any old way. And in addition to that, these high places were often places that were sacred to pagan gods that were of the Canaanites who went before them. So Hezekiah wanted to reform and make the worship right. And so this is the first thing that Manasseh did. He put those high places back up. Also in verse 3, he makes altars to pagan gods. So not only does he allow God's worship to be polluted, he makes other altars to other gods now too. False god worship is now sanctioned and encouraged even by the king. It says that he worshipped the stars, or literally he worshipped the hosts or the armies of heaven. So all of the constellations and such, he looked to them for, for guidance and he served them, it says. And then, if it wasn't bad enough to, to do all of this, he even brought the pagan altars that he built for the false gods, he brought those into God's house. Brought pagan worship into God's house. It's not bad enough to cheat on God. He had to cheat on God in God's house, in the sacred temple. He practices child sacrifice. It says he made his son pass through the fire. In uh, Second Chronicles, when it talks about Manasseh, it says sons, plural. So he did it more than once. Jeremiah talks about this. He says, For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Himmon, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. This is an abomination to the Lord. And he used occult practices. He seeks out mediums and tries to communicate with the dead and so forth. And... Uh, so I was studying this passage, verse 6, where it talks about child sacrifice and then going to the occult, is, it's almost like they had Deuteronomy 18 in mind here, because Manasseh is going directly against everything that is said in just a couple of verses here. It says in Deuteronomy 18, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a wizard or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. So verse 6, it's almost like, Manasseh saw this passage almost and decided, I'm going to do exactly this. Verse 9, when you're a king with absolute power, your failures are the nation's failures too. It's not just you that is going into idolatry and doing awful things. You're also leading your whole nation to do the same things. It's not like a democracy, you know, where you elect an official and then they're term limited and other things like that. I mean, you're a king with absolute power. What you say goes. And so if you are doing these things, then everybody else is in that environment too. 
It says in verse 9, literally, Manasseh led the people astray. He led them astray. And also in verse 9, as well as verse 11, and this, this really stands out in the biblical narrative, no other king is described as worse than the Canaanites. Manasseh hits a new low for all of the kings of Israel and Judah. No other king is described this way. He is even worse than the nations that God drove out before. Now, Ahab, you know, is sometimes referred to as the worst of kings. He is only mentioned to be as bad as the nations. Nobody else is described as worse. Manasseh found the depths of depravity and idolatry and decided to go even further. So we have this picture of Manasseh here. And the picture of Manasseh is of deliberate and comprehensive disobedience. It was not misguided. It was deliberate. And it was not partial. It was total. It's almost as if he looked at God's law and decided to break every single one of those things. It's like going down the list of the Apostles' Creed and denying each one, each point. Manasseh has a grandson named Josiah, and he's like the last good king that Judah would see. And when he reads the law of God, it says he weeps and he tears his clothes because of all of the ways that they had broken that law. Manasseh, his father, was Hezekiah, and he was one of the most godly kings Hezekiah was. This is Manasseh's father. So Manasseh knew better. He knew better. This was not how he was raised. Sometimes when kids grow up, they do their own thing. They don't act like how we raise them to, to be. So Manasseh knew better. And we don't know why. We don't know why. It doesn't say why he did this. It just says that he did. He just simply does these things. And if all this wasn't enough, it says in verse 16, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. So, I mean, when I read that, I'm, I'm, I get this picture of like, some guy who's like a gangster who's just wiping out people left and right. Or even almost like, a, like the concentration camps where there's these bodies all over the place. It says he filled Jerusalem from one end to the other. There's an ancient historian named Josephus. He, was, um, he lived in the first century, so it was about the same time as Jesus. And this is what he says of Manasseh here. By setting out from a contempt of God, he barbarously slew all the righteous men that were among the Hebrews, nor would he spare the prophets, for he every day slew some of them till Jerusalem was overflown with blood. It's a bloodthirsty guy. If you, uh, if you look at all of the prophets that are in the Bible here, not one of them overlaps with Manasseh. There's an there's a old, uh, I don't know if it's a legend, it's a tradition that Isaiah was killed by Manasseh. It says he was sawn in two by Manasseh. Now if you look at Chronicles and you read about Manasseh in Chronicles, there's a different ending. 2 Chronicles 33 tells us that Manasseh repented, but Kings lets us sit with the gravity of his sin. It doesn't give us a happy ending. Chronicles does, but Kings doesn't. Kings lets us just sit with how devastating all of his actions were. And that's very interesting to me. Kings is, Kings is its main 
point of Kings is to talk about how Israel failed. How, and as it's relevant to us, how we fail God. We can't do it. We need to be saved. We cannot save ourselves. And so that is the picture of Manasseh. He failed. Now his repentance might have saved him, but leading an entire nation into the depths of idolatry for 50-some years doesn't get fixed overnight. Manasseh may have repented, and he may have confessed his sin, but when you lead a whole nation down this road for that long, it doesn't fix itself that quickly. People are in all of these habits and patterns. So 2 Kings mentions Manasseh long after he's gone. 2 Kings 23, 26 and 24 verse 3 both say that Manasseh was the main reason why Jerusalem fell. He was the reason. He was the one who set them up for failure. So I have both of those verses on the screen here. It says, Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And then the next one, Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done. It was Manasseh that put the nation on a path of no return. And God says that specifically to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, verse 4. Jeremiah 15 is actually one of the more chilling passages of the prophets. And there's one verse here. God says, And I will make them a horror to all of the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. He plunged into the depths of apostasy and idolatry and he set the nation on a course that it would not be corrected from anymore. In Jeremiah, <clears throat> your Bible reading track for this week, or this day actually, it's going to talk about, it's going to mention some of these sins of Manasseh. It's going to talk about how there is judgment that's going to come because of it. The wages of sin is death. But then there's some hope after that, that God is going to be the one to save Israel. God is going to be the one to save them. It says Manasseh shed much innocent blood. Manasseh would have killed Jesus. Jesus was the epitome of an innocent one who died and was condemned to death. Manasseh would have killed his own descendant. He killed his own son or sons. Why wouldn't he kill his descendant either? But we all would have killed Jesus. We all would have. Let's look at the screen isn't God also merciful? God is certainly merciful, but He is also just. His justice demands that sin committed against His supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, eternal punishment of body and soul. So can we pay this debt ourselves? Certainly not. Actually, we increase our guilt every day. So, some thoughts for us as we think about Manasseh. All of us are sinners. <clears throat> All of us. And while some sins are more damaging than others, every small sin is enough to crucify Jesus. Every small sin. And James talks about this. It puts it this way. It says, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. 
For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So Manasseh is a lawbreaker. You and I, we're lawbreakers. And it's because of our sins that Jesus went to the cross. So even these little sins that we think, oh, it's just something small. It's not like I killed somebody or anything. Even the little sins are enough to make us lawbreakers. And being lawbreakers is what sent Jesus to the cross. Manasseh reminds us that it's God's people who need forgiveness most. Manasseh was one of God's people. He was even in the line of Christ. And he was the son of one of the best kings that the Jews had ever known. Or arguably one of the best. And yet, he was the one who was the worst. There's a man named G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton rather, and a newspaper once asked him a question because he was writing a book called What's Wrong with the World? And so he was writing this book called What's Wrong with the World? And so this newspaper sent him a letter saying, so what is wrong with the world? And he wrote a very simple response. He says, dear sirs, I am. Sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? I am. If you're, if you're a Christian, then one of the things that that means is that you have admitted that you yourself are a sinner, that you are a lawbreaker, and that you simply need forgiveness. You need the grace of God. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot just be a good person to erase bad things. You need God's grace. If you're a Christian, then we need to recognize that we are sinners and we need God's grace and therefore we are part of the problem of this world. What's wrong with the world? I am. Jesus came not for the already righteous, but for sinners who need salvation. And he says that directly. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. If you hear the call of Jesus in your life and in your heart, then you need to be a sinner. If you're a righteous person, then you don't need Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're righteous only because of Jesus. His righteousness is given to you. Not because of what we have done, but because of what He has done. So we are clothed in His righteousness. But we ourselves are are sinners. So we need to remember that. We need to have that humility. And when we look at these awful people who plunge into the depths of depravity, that we are lawbreakers too. That's us. And aside from the grace of God, we would be Manasseh. And we would be like every awful person that we think it just does the worst, most unthinkable things who we see on the news. That would be us if it wasn't for the grace of God. So we need to have some humility about that. Christians sometimes have this, this reputation of looking down their noses at other people who do bad things. We can't do that. We are lawbreakers. And if you're a Christian, you have admitted that you are a lawbreaker and you need the grace of God. And the other thing about Manasseh is that nothing can stop God's plan. God can make his salvation come from even Manasseh. 
Jesus Christ is our salvation, and God can make his salvation come out of somebody as awful as this, even. It says that Jesus was a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. A shoot from the stump. So that means that there was this big tree, and that tree was cut. The tree was cut, and it was, it was cut because of people like Manasseh. But a shoot came out of that stump, and that is our salvation. Only God can make salvation come out of sin's devastation like this. Nothing can stop God's plan. God has this plan. This is the way I think about it anyways. The end is certain. So Jesus coming to save us, that was, that was certain. That was going to happen. But God, that's the plan, but we have some choices in this mix too. So God kind of says to us, all right, we can do this the easy way or the hard way, but it's going to get done. Manasseh reminds us that we often opt for the hard way. We want to do it our way and the hard way. But God's plan is not thwarted. Not even with somebody as awful as Manasseh. Manasseh shows that our sin brings disaster. It does. And let's think about ourselves here a minute. Let's not think about all of the awful people that we're sitting next to or that are in the world. It's our sin that brings disaster. When we do things that we know better than not to do, there's disaster that comes from that. And maybe it's not always evident right away, but it's there. And so this is what Manasseh reminds us or teaches us. That we need to not do things the hard way. We need to do them God's way. But as much as our sin brings disaster, which Manasseh shows us, Jesus, coming from the line of Manasseh, shows us that God brings salvation from disaster. There is redemption that God offers us. Even if you are as bad of a sinner as Manasseh, God can bring salvation. And God calls us to repentance. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is what God offers. There is hope and there is love from God, even though we can be even the worst of sinners. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, when we think about people like Manasseh and all of the terrible things that he did, it's amazing that you would still keep your promises to people like us. And Lord, each one of us are sinners too. And we can come before you only because of your grace that you've shown us in Jesus Christ, who is our salvation. So thank you. Thank you, Lord, for making salvation come out of the disaster that we have caused by our sin. And help us to celebrate the wonderful gift of Jesus in this season. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.